from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, good morning. I'm Jennifer Harpster, a research specialist in science, technology, and business division here at the Library of Congress. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Big Ice Sheets, Doing Big Things, Why It Is a Big Deal. Mm -hmm. In this presentation, we will learn why we need accurate models to predict the shrinking Greenland and Antarctica ice sheets. This program is the fourth in a series of programs in 2011 presented through a partnership between the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and our division. Uh, this is our fifth year presenting programs with Goddard. Our speaker today, Dr. Robert Ben Shadler, is no stranger to the Library of Congress. In 2007, he visited the library and talked about the warming of the polar regions. In the presentation, who left the freezer door open? what the polls are telling us about climate change. If you're interested in watching this presentation, you can go to the library's webcast page, um, which is at, you can find it at loc.gov, and you could just simply type in NASA and climate change. Uh, Dr. Ben Shadler received a bachelor's degree in astronomy and physics from the University of Michigan, and a doctorate in geophysics from the University of Washington. He recently retired as Chief Scientist at Goddard's Hydrospheric and Biospheric Sciences Laboratory after 30 years at NASA. In addition to his position as Emeritus Scientist at the laboratory, he is also the Senior Research si Scientist at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Dr. Ben Scheidler is one of the world's experts on the Earth's glaciers and ice sheets. He has led 15 Antarctic field expeditions and participated in many more. He has published over 140 scientific papers. He's served as president as the, of the International Glaciolo Glaciological Society, is editor of the Journal of Glaciology, and has also testified numerous times before Congress. And I'd also like to note he was also asked to brief Al Gore when he was vice president on the stability of ice sheets and shelves. So it is my great honor to welcome Dr. Robert Ben Shadler back to the library. Thanks very much, Jennifer, and uh, thank you all for coming. As Jennifer said, I've been here before. Actually, uh, I, I kicked off the set of lectures that Jeannie Allen has, has organized with the library to bring earth science to you, and maybe even more than earth science. I don't know if it's expanded to space science, but earth science is, is my beat and what I care about most. Um, so it's good to be back. Um, I could just say, just remember everything I said back in 2007 is even worse now and just <laughs> leave the stage, but I won't do that. I'll remind you of, of, of some of what's going on because it, it is actually quite exciting as a scientist, but uh, of concern, I think, for, uh, should be for people on the, on the planet. Um, and um, just referring to Jeannie one more time, um, many of the years I spent at, at Goddard, I was uh, in an office across the hallway from Jeannie, and it was she that said that, okay, you give wonderful presentations, but you really need to talk about yourself a little bit at the beginning. So, so now that she's in the audience, I dare not not do that, because she was absolutely right. Um, and, and often I, I like to talk about uh, being a scientist to the kids. Um, they're great audiences, but you are as well. And so I'll, I'll just truncate this sort of self-introduction by saying that being a scientist is one heck of a lot of fun. And I get to fantasize about, about sort of standing in the shadow of these two major figures, uh, Sherlock Holmes and Indiana Jones. Why do I pick those two? because Sherlock Holmes solves mysteries, and that's actually what led me to be a scientist. I loved reading mysteries, and I I'm still have the privilege and, and um, fun of solving mysteries. That's what scientists do. And uh, because many of my mysteries lie in pretty remote areas, I also get a little bit of adventure uh, laced in with, with that um, effort. So, so I get to play both roles. And, um, 
I'm not going to inspire any of you, I think, to change your careers and become scientists, but I'm sure many of you influence the decisions that many children make and uh, tell them that, that science actually is, a, is really a very rewarding and fun and enjoyable career, and you get paid for it. So what could be better? Um, just to lay out what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to uh, step, I'm going to start not by talking about ice, but just talking about earth science in general and a few important concepts. And it's because it's very important for earth scientists when we have opportunities like this to speak to general audiences to get some of these points across. Uh, and the basic structure of the talk is uh, letting you know what we know we know, letting you know what we know we don't know, what we think we know about the don't knows, <laughs> And how we're going to find how and when we're going to find out more about the don't knows, and then and then finally what you should know when you leave here. So that's that's the basic um, outline of the talk. So the important concepts that that I do want to touch on before I focus in on ice um, are these are these three: the big and fast do matter, uh, weather versus climate. There's a lot of confusion out in the in the community about that. And uh, there's also conf confusion in my community about what scientists should do and what they shouldn't do. Uh, and as I said, these are general statements I'll be making. First of all, the time scale matters. I mean, when you hear people talking about um, earth science observations, um, it's very important that they specify, and if they don't, that you have clear in your mind what time scale they're talking about. Um, big changes that take 10,000 years to occur are going to be less uh, less concerned than even smaller changes that happen much faster. So, and it's because of this time scale issue that Earth scientists are so concerned about what's changing. Things are changing really fast, and is that rate of change that matters so much, and often more than the magnitude. It's how fast they're changing. Just keep that in mind. And so, if, if I see small or brief changes. That makes a great scientific paper, and I'll tell my colleagues about that. But you probably won't hear about that unless you read some of these uh, very technical journals. If I see large changes, my phone is probably ringing because a reporter wants to hear about that. And, and you may read about it in the paper, a big iceberg calving off, something like that. But if I see large changes that are sustained, that's when I go across the street and, and because people in Congress want to know about it. So, and it's, and it's because we're seeing in my world, the world of ice, these large and sustained changes that put us on a trajectory of, of concern that I have testified a number of times um, across the street to various committees. Oh, I got the punchline there. I tell Congress we have large and sustained changes. They're usually quick to ask, by the way. They really are on top of things. Um, weather and climate are not the same thing. <coughs> And I want to really get this point across, um, that weather is things that happen, you know, the changes in our climate that, that occur in, on the minutes to months time scale. That's why time scale is so important. But climate is something on the decadal to century time scale. So, so it's very easy for the, for the discussion about these two um, concepts to, to get confused. And, and the best metaphor I can give is that weather is like rolling the dice and climate is like rolling the dice a lot. And the uncertainty of these two is very, very different. This is why casinos make money. They, un they are sort of in the climate business. They know the statistics of they have lots of customers and over time this is how the, the odds are going to lay out and, and they make their money on knowing, knowing that very precisely. So if you have a pair of dice and you roll it, I, I can give you my best estimate of what you're going to come up with. Standard dice would be seven. One out of six times you'll roll a seven. But five times I'll be wrong. But if you roll those dice a hundred times or a thousand times or a million times, the more times you roll it, I can get really precise about how many sevens you're going to get. And so that's why climate prediction actually is getting very good, even though weather prediction has, has been quite a struggle. They are different, very different. And climate change, just to extend this metaphor one more slide, is, is like loading the dice. It's really defining a new normal, if you will. And that we're still going to see much the same kind of weather. It's going to be variable and it's going to be hard to predict. 
And so any single weather event is not direct evidence of climate change. It cannot be done. And any scientist that says it is wrong, and any non-scientist that says it is wrong. Weather is weather, climate is climate. However, by loading the dice, you're really changing climate in, in, and again, in, in this metaphor, we'll see familiar weather, but the likelihood of those events will be changing. The statistics will change. The odds of, of, of particular weather patterns will change. That's what climate change is about, and I, and I hope that helps. Um, and then finally, I said I wanted to talk about the scientist's role. This is what we do. This is what we should be doing. We observe. We try to understand those observations in, in the sense of how different elements in that we're observing interact. Um, peer review, this is our community. We, we are, and my wife will attest to this, very critical people. Um, critical in the sense that we critique things. Sometimes we think we're critical in the other way too, and I think we are, but, but I'm talking more about, about we self-critique our own work extremely uh, rigorously, and that's the peer review system, and it works very, very well. Um, so that's an aspect of the, of the community that's important. And then this reporting uh, function is becoming more and more important. I was saying to a few people here before, before we uh, started that um, communication of results uh, is now part of what a nurse scientist needs to do. It's not just talking to ourselves. It's, it's telling people what we understand. Um, and finally here, it should not be. And too often, uh, some of my colleagues, and I try to catch myself too, um, the role of a scientist is not to advocate a particular response. It's to provide the information, to talk about the what-if scenarios, and the, if this happens, then that is likely going to happen as well as we understand it. It's not we should take a particular position and uh, certain policy. Scientists should not be doing that. Okay, my message today. Um, so here we get to the ice part. Uh, we just recorded the most dramatic decade of, of ice sheet changes ever witnessed. And this is, this is where the, the science that I do really gets fun. We're, we're seeing things that, that when I was learning the trade in glaciology in graduate school, we didn't even think ice sheets could do. But not only uh, do we have evidence that, we, that they are doing some of these things, and I'll, I'll be more specific later, uh, we have actual observations that, that they're doing those things. Um, Society is extremely vulnerable to sea level. This is the direct connection between why ice sheets matter. A lot of ice contained in ice sheets as they shrink, sea level goes up, and society around the world, this is the global we, are very vulnerable to that. Uh, there's, there's some obvious reasons for that. We love being close to the ocean. High-priced real estate, economies, um, developed ports, and um, so, and navies uh, build and operate ships out of bases that are all at, at the sea coast. Um, I'm not going to give this one away. Ice sheets will continue to shrink. I'm, that's part of uh, what I'll be talking about, so, so stay tuned on that. And as, as direct consequences of, of what ice sheets are doing, sea level will increase. We know that. That's one of the things that we do know. And the rate of rise will likely increase. That's one of the things we don't know, but we think we know something about that. And uh, our best estimate, many people need numbers, these people across the street included. And uh, right now, keep in mind this one meter uh, rise in sea level by the end of this century. That's really the best number my community uh, has come up with so far. And I'll, I'll um, give you a little bit more information about that. And that we will get better with time. And uh, I'll be talking about that too, what we know we know, what we know we know, what we know we don't know, and how we're going to find out more about the don't knows. Okay, ice sheets. They're really big. You know, if I could tell you one thing about ice sheets I really wanted to emphasize, they're huge. I mean, Antarctica is a continent, and it's not, it's seven continents, and it's not the seventh uh, continent in terms of size. It's the fourth. It's right, right in the middle of the pack. It's, it's larger than the United States, including Alaska. You have to throw in Mexico to get, to get enough surface area to match Antarctica. It is enormous. And 90% of all the ice on the planet is contained in that ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet. So there's a lot of ice there, enough that if you melted just that ice sheet alone, sea level would rise 55 meters. So 
that's the big kahuna. That's that's the one that that you know where the massive signal is. Um, the Greenland ice sheet is the other ice sheet, sort of the lesser uh, of the two. And nine percent of all the ice on the planet is contained in the Greenland ice sheet. So you add those two together, and you're already at ninety-nine percent. You only have one percent left, and that's the one percent you may be more familiar with. The glaciers and the small ice caps are sprinkled around high altitude uh, areas, mountain chains around the world, um, as well as uh, some polar regions. So there's a lot of ice on the planet, and it has waxed and waned. Um, so when we talk about that one meter rise in sea level, there's so much ice. If you add all of this together, that's enough to raise sea level 65 meters. So, so we're not talking about a big change in the ice sheet when we're talking about what it would require to raise sea level one meter. Actually, it's only like 1% decrease in the size of the ice sheet, and we're almost there. That alone would give us 65 centimeters, uh, two-thirds of uh, the one meter. And then there are other effects, the thermal expansion of the ocean, that can take us the, the remainder of the way. So, so we're not talking about a big change in the ice sheets. We really won't notice that they're not there, because most of them will still be there, uh, but yet society will be, have to um, um, deal with this one meter rise. And I'll show what that means uh, uh, very shortly. So um, what we know, what we know, looking at the past, this is more paleoclimate information. Uh, and I'll just list these things that, some major things that we know and then show you some data as to the, sort of back up the statements. Um, ice sheets shrink in a warmer climate. Well, duh, you know, that's, that's uh, although there have been those that said, okay, in a warmer climate, we expect, and there will be, and we've measured, uh, increased snowfall because the warmer atmosphere holds more moisture, it will snow more. And that, in fact, does occur. But it's, it's, it's more than outweighed by the loss of ice by those warmer temperatures. And, and so there really is no doubt that in warmer climates, there's less ice. And we're headed that way. Um, we also know that you've heard about the ice ages and what we call the interglacials, those periods between the ice ages, as, as the size of the ice sheet and the temperature of the planet has, 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 cold, has become colder and warmer and colder and warmer, and the ice sheets grow and shrink and grow and shrink. Well, the last time we had an interglacial, a warm period, sea level was higher than it was today, or than it is today, by about five meters. And both Greenland and Antarctica were smaller, and they both contributed to that. Um, and we know, we know that from, from various lines of evidence. So it has been higher. We also know that the rate at which sea level rises, and I said rate of change is really important, and this is one instance where, where that comes to the fore. How fast sea level rises is a really, really big deal. And again, we have records that indicate that um, we have observations that tell us that sea level the last century was, was increasing only about two millimeters a year. It's not much, although when you think about how, how shallow the slope is at the coast, that two millimeters vertical rise actually does translate into a thousand times, a hundred, a thousand, sometimes ten thousand times uh, more horizontal movement of the, of the, um, of the coast. So, so it amplifies what may seem like a very small vertical um, change uh, into a much larger number. So it was about two millimeters per year last century. This century, it's, it's already started to increase. It's, it's past three now. Uh, the highest uh, number I've heard so far in the last couple of years is about 3.8 uh, millimeters per year. So almost twice what the average was last century. And uh, satellites are very good at, at, at measuring this in a global sense. But we have geologic evidence that, that says that in the past, sea level has risen 10 times faster than that. So again, that's not hypothetical. Those, those are um, direct uh, evidence that, uh, that sea level can rise much faster than it is even at present. And I'll talk quite a bit about tidewater glaciers. So I'll, um, I'll explain here. A tidewater glacier is a glacier that comes out of the mountains goes into what would be a fjord if the ice and the glacier wasn't filling it. So it actually comes in contact with the water and fills that fjord and displaces that water. Tidewater glaciers are, are useful um, uh, glaciers to look at in terms of a dynamics because, because they 
they do exhibit some very dramatic behavior and a lot of the ice sheets drain through what essentially are tidewater glaciers, glaciers that are thick enough and, and big enough and move fast enough that they just flow right out into the ocean. And so the dynamics of tidewater glaciers, whether they appear in Alaska or at the edge of an ice sheet, are quite important. And we know that this dramatic and episodic behavior of retreat is something that they, that they are capable of. And I'll speak more about that in a moment. So on the less ice, is, less ice in warmer climates, this is just some of the evidence. If you line up on the top, this is a record of sea level as it has raised and lowered over time. Less ice is, is the upper part of that, and, and uh, more ice is the lower part of that. And you line that up with a temperature record that came from an ice core drilled at Vostok Station in Antarctica, if you, if you care to know, uh, that takes us back 400,000 years, and there are ways to extract from that ice what the, what the average temperature was. Um, it also has fluctuated colder, warmer, colder, warmer as we went through these glacial and interglacial cycles. And you line those two up. And so the last 400,000 years, every time the Earth is getting warmer, it's losing ice. And these records go back more than a million years now. It just happens every single time. So there's just no doubt. That's why I can say with absolute confidence, we know we know this. And I mentioned uh, I spoke to the rate of sea level. This is just uh, some data that was pulled together on from the end of the last glacial period, about 20,000 years ago, how rapidly sea level rose between then and now. And you see that it, that it has risen. Um, and for the last 8,000 years, it hasn't been rising very rapidly. Um, that's where that curve gets quite flat. I don't tend to like to point at charts because it's often hard to follow. But up here, um, this is when most of society developed, you know, from uh, the last 8,000 years. So we, we became comfortable with the world and, and uh, societies and cultures evolved uh, in the midst of, of um, a climate where sea level was not rising particularly rapidly. So we kind of set ourselves up. Had, had we to be vulnerable, had we developed during these meltwater pulses when there were sudden losses of large fractions of the ice sheet, we might have learned to become more wary of, of living close to the coast or at least developed our infrastructure a little bit differently. But this is just to say that, that there is evidence that, that sea level has gone through periods of time where over the course of a few centuries it's rising more than 10 times faster than, than it is today. So, and this is because of ice sheets. There's really nothing else in the climate system that can cause sea level to go up that fast at, at that kind of rate. So these are ice sheets speaking to us from the past. Um, I mentioned tidewater glaciers. I, I said a little bit, I'll say a little bit more. This is um, uh, just a couple of pictures to illustrate uh, if anybody shows you this and they talk about, okay, glaciers are retreating worldwide, well, this really isn't a fair uh, example to, to show. This is a tidewater glacier, one that retreats exceptionally rapidly. And over the course of a few decades, it had filled that fjord and it, and it retreated back around the corner. Um, and so, again, we, we know that this happens. We've, we've observed it, and we have lots of uh, paleoclimate data to tell us that lots of glaciers have done this. I'll speak a little bit later about the process by which it does that. Okay, so what do we know about the present? This is still the what, what we know we know. Um, and again, I'll just emphasize this, that it has been a, an incredible decade for, for glaciologists to, to s witness what's going on. Uh, it's, it's not the hypotheticals that we had been studying in, in decades past. We're actually seeing things happen right before our eyes. Thanks to satellites, I should say. I should give the nod to NASA there. They and, and other um, space agencies have just, we've gone from a data-starved situation where you had to go to the field and set your tent and make a few measurements to know anything about what was going on. And these areas, like I said, are really big um, to a, a data-rich environment where satellites are collecting just a wealth of information. So we know what's going on there. And and that's been fundamental to us being, making, becoming aware of, of these, these changes because it has not always been so. Uh, I'll emphasize in, in, a, in a 
diagram a little bit later that the largest changes are happening at the margins. And a couple of uh, ways we see that is that these large floating ice shelves, these big plates of ice fed by the ice sheet, are rapidly disintegrating and that the outlet glaciers are accelerating. And that's, that's a way that the ice sheet loses mass and it's losing mass faster than snowfall can replenish it and that's why this next bullet, the increasing rate of ice sheet mass loss, the ice sheets are shrinking faster and faster. I'll illustrate that again. Um, I won't talk any more about the nearly all glaciers are retreating because even if you got rid of all the other glaciers and just set ice sheets aside for the moment, you would get about half a meter of uh, increased sea level, not even quite that now. So, so that's important. It contributes, but it's not, um, it's not going to break the back of, uh, of society. And then finally, I just want to hammer this point home that, that society is exceedingly vulnerable to sea level increases. I think I, so I'll, I'll illustrate each of those points here. So now the ice sheets are colored uh, by, uh, in colors that represent where, how, how the elevation of the ice sheet is changing. So is the ice sheet getting thicker or thinner is, is, um, is identified by color here with the browns and the, and the purples being where it's getting thicker, although the rates aren't as high, as the greens and the blues where it's getting thinner. And you see the green and blue areas are always around the coast, it's always around the coast. So it does snow a little bit more in the interior of the Greenland ice sheet. That's, that's a fact. It's been measured by satellite altimeters. Um, but it's losing mass much faster around the edges because it's thinning. Again, satellite altimeters tell us this. And it's not everywhere. It turns out that the areas that around the margins that are thinning most rapidly are those where you have fast, deep glaciers draining the ice back into the ocean. And that was an important clue uh, as to what was going on. And, okay, so I indicated disintegrating ice shelves as one of the big surprises. This, this was probably the biggest surprise, the biggest early surprise, certainly. Um, this is the Antarctic Peninsula. I show, I show just in that inset on the lower left where it's from. And um, 200 miles long, so from here to New York City, just to give you an idea of the scale. And so these ice shelves that you see disintegrating in, in this time lapse are not, are not small. They are, they are hundreds of square kilometers. Another important aspect of them is that they grow very slowly because you have to have snowfall accumulate in the mountains of the peninsula, form a glacier, that glacier flows out onto the ocean, the ocean kind of eats away at it so it, it keeps feeding ice and eventually over thousands of years these ice shelves form. Well they're disintegrating in the matter of weeks. So I mean the, the difference in the time scale there is just enormous, orders of magnitude. So that was why we were so astonished to see these ice shelves sort of here today, gone tomorrow, or here yesterday, gone today. Um, this was a really, really big deal. Um, just some figures from a paper, I apologize, it looks confusing. The important part is, is um, the, the words outlined in the colors there, that we were able to monitor two of these glaciers, because there was this big debate in the community Ice shelves matter. No, ice shelves don't matter. Um, and uh, this, this settled that, that disagreement. Um, it said that the glaciers that feed an ice shelf notice when that ice shelf goes away. Because some people said it just wouldn't happen. Uh, well, nature gave us the perfect experiment and got rid of ice shelves in a matter of a few weeks, and these glaciers accelerated. Not a little bit, but a lot. I mean, you see the numbers there. In just two years, two of these glaciers that we had good speeds on before the ice shelf went away. Uh, so that was sort of the, the, the uh, initial state. Um, they sped up by a factor of four and a factor of five. So they knew and they responded very quickly to the loss of that ice shelf. It's nice to have a debate in the community resolved so clearly by Mother Nature where, where, there's, uh, where there's just no disputing the, the results. And so those glaciers accelerated, and I was, I've been talking about accelerating glaciers, and, and that's, off, that's off in the peninsula here, that 
400% increase and 510% increase. But we've also measured acceleration of glaciers in many other areas. Uh, and those areas are those same areas that are thinning. So as you get thinning, that's kind of uh, occurs in lockstep with the acceleration of the ice and also the retreat. I'll show the retreat slide in a moment. But again, the numbers are not small. Glaciologists are, are accustomed to smaller numbers, things happening much more slowly on an annual basis. These, in some cases, are the change over a five-year uh, average period. But, uh, but still, they're, they're big. They're big. They're an extra couple of digits. We, we weren't used to this. So it's, it's a far more dramatic world um, that uh, glaciologists are having to deal with. That's what ha what's happening at the coast. But again, the concern is overall, is the ice sheet getting bigger or smaller? Well, these numbers say that overall, the ice sheets are getting smaller. And lots of people are studying, uh, studying this with various data sets. That's why there are so many different colored boxes. Every colored box there is another scientific paper dealing with <laughs> some data set in some way to get a, a handle on some period of time, whether the ice sheet, in this case Greenland, is getting uh, larger or smaller. So, so the, the time period um, is, they're all ordered by time down here. So this, this was uh, 30 years ago, and this is now. Um, and the vertical is how rapidly it's losing mass. If it's not losing mass at all, it's up here at zero, the mass balance, balance between accumulation and melting and discharge. Or they balance each other, so no, no change in the um, mass of the ice sheet versus a greater and greater rate of mass loss all the way down until you get to 360 gigatons per year. That doesn't mean anything to you. A, a gigaton is a cubic kilometer. That still probably doesn't mean too much to you. Um, but to put it in terms that may mean something to you, 360 gigatons per year will raise the ocean around the world a millimeter. That's, so these are big numbers. That's a big change in sea level, uh, a large fraction of what we're already measuring. And, and your eye tells you what's going on. Uh, once you, you know, <laughs> the individual uh, scientists that wrote individual papers here will, will, have, will have laborious arguments about my number's right, your number's wrong. No, my number's right, your number's wrong. And, and it wasn't until we put all, all these numbers together and we said, whoa, you know, the big picture is just irrefutable that the ice sheet used to be far more stable just 30 years ago. I got my degree right here in 1978. Everything was fine. And then the world has just been turned on its head and Greenland is just losing mass faster and faster and faster. How about Antarctica? Greenland's the small one. How about Antarctica? Same picture. Same picture. It's, it's bigger, there are fewer studies, it's just harder to collect and, and analyze data for an ice sheet that's 10 times the size of Greenland, but a lot of people have taken that on and you arrange their data, uh, you know, you leave them in the other room arguing about whose number's right and, and you just take all those papers and you put them on a single chart and you get the same picture. It used to be more stable and, and it's losing mass faster and faster and faster. So this is happening. Okay, let's, let's talk about the impact just briefly. Again, um, I always key in on this one meter of sea level rise. And if you look at the map of the world, this is just the Earth at night. You may recognize that famous image. Um, and just color in red all the areas of the coast that would be flooded with a one meter rise in sea level. And you can see instantly why this is not a polar problem. This is a global problem because all the continents end at the coast. So there are coastlines all around, all around the world. Some of them are, are very heavily populated. Bangladesh right here, Irrawaddy Delta right here. Um, and the U.S. is, you know, you have New Orleans down here. You have the Piedmont area, uh, Virgin Southern Virginia, and North Carolina. Um, there are a lot of areas where there are a lot of people. Um, let's view it another way. This... <laughs> This picture down the bottom is the Maldives, and and with, in all seriousness, the prime minister of the Maldives held a cabinet meeting underwater. Everybody, all them, all the cabinet officers put on scuba gear, and they had a table 
uh, under the water, and he had a cabinet meeting there. This was just before COP15, the Copenhagen climate meeting, to make a point that his country is, is a set of islands, and this is one of them, and it's a typical one, where they, they, can't, they can't suffer much of an increase in sea level before their entire country, not their coastline, their country is flooded. And again, in all seriousness, he was at the meeting trying to negotiate with the prime minister of some other country to move his country as a unit because he doesn't want them to just migrate away. I mean, the, the, the whole cultural existence of the Maldives will then, will then disappear. He wants to move the whole country someplace <coughs> because this is coming. This, this is also from the Maldives. This, this is them dealing with sea level on a daily basis. Oh, there was, a, in the National Geographic, there was a beautiful um, statistic that New Orleans is losing 44 acres per day. That's a, con New Orleans and uh, Louisiana, southern Lu Louisiana gets hit with a triple whammy. Sea level's going up. There's, there's tectonic um, depression of Louisiana because when there was a big ice sheet in, in Canada, it pushed Canada down and pushed Louisiana up. Well, that ice sheet's gone, so Canada's going up. And it's kind of laughing at sea level rise because it's going up faster. But Louisiana's going down. So you've got sea level going up, you've got Louisiana going down, and then all that Mississippi sediment, Mississippi River sediment, is consolidating. So it loses on all three, all three scores, and 44 acres are being flooded a day in southern Louisiana. So, but let's look at it globally, and, then, and that's just in terms of land area lost, separated by continent, for a one meter rise in sea level. Asia is going to lose the most. Uh, North America actually is going to lose next. Um, but how about in terms of population? Asia, the big, big loser, and that's, that's Bangladesh, parts of India, uh, Southeast Asia, um, and uh, Indonesia. Um, and then uh, North America, not so bad. Europe was second there. But in terms of the uh, economic value, again, Asia is the big loser. Europe loses a lot. The Netherlands figures in heavily here. Um, so uh, you look at it, slice and dice it different ways. One meter rise in sea level is, well, this used to be a lot, um, almost a trillion dollars. But um, I can't say that's a lot of money anymore, can I? But uh, for most of these countries, it still is. So it's, it's a big, 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 big deal. Um, see, uh, rapid sea level rise must be from rapid and sustained ice mass loss. No other way to get it. But we've never witnessed such an event. And I'm talking about the really rapid stuff. I'm talking not, not three and a half millimeters a year, but, but 10 mil millimeters a year. So what, do, what we know, we don't know. We don't know how it happens, the actual processes. We don't know if we can recognize enough, if we can recognize the early signs of it. And so we're certainly not in the position to predict as well as we would like uh, future dramatic behavior. So I'm, I've eaten up most of my time here. I'm going to have to accelerate myself. Um, but the prime culprit, I, I have to talk about this because this is where the science gets really fun. Um, prime culprit is, and I pause here, just to give you a chance to see if you can tell me there, there's a one word description of why all this is going on. Warmth, it's related to warmth. I'm not hearing it. It's water. So th this is the fun part for a scientist to talk about that. Ice sheets hate water. You know, if you can remember four words, I want you to remember a lot more than four <laughs> words, but remember these four words. Ice sheets hate water, which just seems so ironic because ice sheets are made of water, right? So, so but water is, feels hot to an ice sheet. You know, if you're, you're getting uh, ice off your windshield, you know, you want to pour more warm water on it, pour cold water on it. It'll go away almost as quickly. Ice hates water. There's too much heat contained in, in water. So why does it hate water? Um, <coughs> I'll give you a few reasons, but I've arranged these in terms of rates of change. Um, and I'll start out with a slow one and not say much more about it. It enhances melt. It makes snow darker. It, it um, absorbs more radiation, there's, there's an amplification factor there. But that's, but I wouldn't be here and nobody, would, nobody else would care about ice sheets if that's all there was to it. It can lubricate the bed. I'll, I'll show an example of that. 
It can actually break up ice shelves through a process of hydrofracture. I'll show an illustration of that. And um, it can melt the floating edges of ice sheets, these ice shelves, these big flat plates. And that's, that's really the killer, as it turns out. And I want to get to that point, so let me go quickly. Um, there is the, the, the atmospheric temperatures are on the rise, and we do see an increase in the, in the extent of melt and the amount of melt around the perimeter of the Greenland ice sheet. That's contributing to the shrinkage of the ice sheet, but it's not the big player. That water collects in really in lakes and rivers and finds its way into the ice sheet. And you see in the lower right there, well, you see on the left an actual picture of what it's doing. And you see in the lower right a, a, a conception, a conceptual illustration of, of why it's influ how it influences the ice sheet. It finds its way all the way down to the, to the rock underneath, and then it flows along that interface and lubricates the ice. And the re reducing friction will allow the ice to flow faster, and you can actually get rid of a lot more ice that way, because not only is the water itself leaving, which was ice before, but it's, but it's uh, sort of allowing more ice to flow faster into the ocean. So there's an even greater amplification there. And you see some numbers there. It, it can increase the flow rate um, you know, tens of percent, primarily in the summer, because that's when you get the melt. Hydrofracture is kind of, kind of interesting. Here again, we see this disintegrating ice shelf in time lapse. And so there are a lot of crevasses on, on ice shelves because the, the ice is stressed and is forced to move in ways it doesn't want to and it cracks. So we know about crevasses and that water obviously fills up, uh, the, uh, flows into the crevasse. But if you have an excess of water and it fills up the crevasse right up to the top, if you think about the forces, this is where the physics I, I like comes in, the force is right down here at the tip. The water is trying to open that crevasse, and it's heavy. And the ice is trying to squeeze that tip shut, and it's not as heavy. So because water is heavier than ice, that tip will go down, and the crevasse goes deeper. And as long as you can keep pouring water in at the top, that crevasse, that crack, will go all the way through. So what's actually happening in this, in this um, sequence is you have water uh, filling crevasses, and then once it, once it separates into a whole bunch of tall, thin slabs, those slabs fall over, and that beautiful powder blue, that picture that you see, you're looking at the color of the inside of the ice shelf. That's, that's what the inside of the ice shelf looks like, and you're seeing it because it got chopped up with this process, and all those tall, thin slabs kind of fell over like dominoes. They were standing on their tall end, and then they fell over. So we've seen that happen. We've inferred that this is the process. But even that's not the worst thing that can happen to an ice shelf. The worst thing that can happen to an ice shelf is it gets attacked by warm water that's in the ocean. And there's so much heat in the ocean, the ice sheets don't stand a chance if that water can get to the ice sheet. And it gets to the ice sheet uh, underneath these floating ice shelves. And this just illustrates that there's, <laughs> in the polar ocean, it's cold on the top because of melting ice. It's cold on the bottom because that's where the, the cold water sinks to. It's actually warm in the middle, and it's warm in the middle just off the continental shelf. And if it's, it's really an issue of if that warm water can get up onto the continental shelf, then we jump to this illustration on the right. It comes up onto the continental shelf, and the first place it can get onto the continental shelf are these valleys that were nicely eroded by the glaciers themselves back in the last ice age. And it's, it's dense water. It sits in this channel. And it just continues to ride down, and it goes down because the ice sheet's heavy and it's tilted the continental shelf this way. So it's up in this channel, and it just it's heavy, and just just slowly flows down that channel until it hits the ice sheet. And that's for an ice sheet. That's hot water. That's a couple of degrees warmer than the ice sheet is. And there's pressure melting effects that come in and just make it even worse. So it melts like crazy. And when it melts, it's essentially this ice shelf disintegration in slow motion. And remember, when the ice shelves disintegrate, the glaciers speed up. So when the ice shelf gets melted and thinned, the, the, the glaciers also speed up. Not a factor of 4 and, and 5, but a factor of 10 and 20 and 30 percent. So this is, this is what's hurting the ice shelves, um, uh, the ice sheets the most. <clears throat> is that heat in the ocean that's that's getting to the uh, to the ice sheets? Um, 
and there's retreat that goes along. This is just amplification of that. I'm going to jump past that because uh, I do want to illustrate uh, some additional data as, as to why we know this is happening. <clears throat> Here we have this, the um, south, well, the western side of Greenland ice sheet in a whole bunch of different years. And the color here is the temperature of the water at the depths where the fishermen fish their cod or, or other fish. And they, they collected these data because they need to know how warm the water is because it determines where they fish and what type of fish they, they equip themselves to catch. So from 1991 here, and there's 92, 93, 94, 95, you, know, you, you see the progression uh, from year to year of how the ocean temperature changed just off the coast of Greenland. And I think you can see this, this warm plume starting up in these warmer colors, these red colors. By the time it gets to this star, that's when that glacier, that big Jakobshavn glacier that, I, that was in the previous slide, began to retreat. So the, the sudden retreat of that, of that it was, I, I, I guess maybe I do need to show it. Um, it, it took 50 years to retreat 10 kilometers. It took another 60 years to retreat the next 10 kilometers. It sat there for about 40 years. And then all of a sudden, it just took off. In only five years, it retreated another 10 kilometers when that warm water entered the fjord. The, the two are, are, are linked together. So we know that the ice sheet responds quickly when warm water appears on the scene. Okay, so how are we going to learn more? I mean, we, we, we don't know anywhere near enough. And we're going to have to learn more by making more direct measurements, field studies. Satellites have taken us a long way but, and helped point us to where we need to go for field studies. Analog studies is an important aspect. I'll, I'll show an illustration there what I'm talking about. More field studies and numerical models and then more field studies because, I'm sorry, there's no substitute for the direct observations. And that's kind of bad news because it's really hard to get these numbers. I mean, the ice sheets are, can be s nasty places to work. Uh, that's why satellite data are so, so popular. For the analog study, we go back to the tidewater glaciers. I think we have seen in observing how tidewater glaciers behave the future of the ice sheets because we're now we're seeing this happen around the margins of the ice sheets this drastic retreat mode that, that we've observed for tidewater <coughs> glaciers in the past and illustrated here by the Muir Glacier um, is happening around the margin. Just to um, illustrate why it's happening, um, you take a glacier coming out of the mountains and it finds the, the ocean there and it has to get a little bit bigger to push the water out of the way and displace the water and it, and it moves material, moves moraine as it, as it slowly advances into the fjord and it builds up this moraine and you'll find a tidewater glacier terminus the end of the uh, glacier is actually in some fairly shallow water because it's sitting on a moraine that it made for itself it can't advance very rapidly because then it gets into deep water and it calves back really rapidly um, so it can only advance slowly and if it retreats off this moraine then it then it changes its dynamics more ice is supplied to reestablish the terminus on this moraine. That's, that's sort of where it, where it needs to be to be quasi-stable. But if it does retreat and it can't supply additional ice to re-advance onto that moraine, it gets into deeper water, calves faster, retreats into deeper water, calves yet faster. And this is this drastic retreat mode that tidewater glaciers are, are designed for itself in, in the nature of its advance. And it will continue to retreat until it gets either to another shallow spot or, or in some cases, all the way out of the fjord. In the case of Muir Glacier, it's all the way out of its fjord. So a tidewater glacier is either, either out here or it's retreating. There really are no two other uh, states for it. Um, I'll show you one video, I hope. This, this is a tidewater glacier. It's calving. This is not a gradual process. That's about 10 DC city blocks worth there that, that just broke off. Um, it's, and, and this is what people are seeing around the, around the margins of the Greenland ice sheet. This is episodic. A glacier will do this until it gets to another shallow spot. 
and it will get all the attention and it gets to the shallow spot and then it stops because it's more it's stable again um, okay one more uh, essentially see the same thing just a big block that cliffs about 50 meters high and and the full thickness of the ice is about six seven times that so um, this if you see James Baylog give give his talk he'll put little capital buildings across there and little Washington <laughs> monuments to give you a better sense of scale um, so um, Columbia Glacier is a tidewater glacier and we actually studied this quite a lot this just as I was uh, ending my degree I had the opportunity to to do some work on this and um, you'll see uh, sort of a, a, a typical tidewater glacier in drastic retreat mode this is where the shallow moraine is this is where the terminus had been for years and years and years and in 1980 it finally lost its grip on it and in the course of 20 years it retreated about 20 kilometers and in year 2000 it was here right now it's turned this corner it hesitated as it turned the corner and it's going to end up back here sometime but I, I show this because you see the glacier nicely you see open water here and then you see all of this stuff it's called Sikasuk and it's that stuff that was in those two videos it's just jumbled ice and it's jumbled ice because there's a glacier feeding it and it's stuck here because it's big chunks of ice that can't get out because of that shallow moraine it's stuck there so the reason for showing this is that that is the visual signature of a tidewater glacier in drastic retreat and I've saved this other side of the slide to show you a Greenland outlet glacier exactly the same we know visually how to recognize a tidewater glacier in drastic retreat mode and I invite you to go to Google Earth and just march around the perimeter of the Greenland ice sheet you will see this signature again and again and again you'll see a glacier you'll see all these this this sort of um, whitish thing you won't see individual icebergs don't probably don't have the resolution to but it's stuck there because there is a shallow moraine there that's a tidewater glacier in drastic retreat mode um, what do I want to say about this um, in Antarctica it's it's somewhat similar um, these we think in Greenland they're triggered these drastic retreats are triggered by the warm water um, sort of uh, forcing the, the ice to lose its grip on these shallow moraines in Antarctica it's a little bit different here you have temperature of the water around Antarctica it's warmer where it's redder and you see that it's in this portion of the Antarctic ice sheet where the warmest ocean water is right adjacent to the ice sheet it's not quite adjacent there is a little continental shelf in between but it's certainly closest there and the ice sheet is most vulnerable in that area these big dots these big red dots say that this part of Antarctica is losing mass faster the size of the dot is how fast it's how fast its uh, mass is changing the red means it's losing so those line up and it tells us again that ocean is responsible um, this is what it looks like if you were there it's a it's a pretty dramatic place full of crevasses this is the Pine Island Glacier ice shelf and I show this because that's where that red spot was biggest and where the where the um, ice loss is most dramatic I also show it because in a few months time that's where I'll be we have a field project going there I mentioned the importance of field measurements um, the British launched this fancy automated submarine uh, it went underneath the ice shelf and it found warm water again color here represents temperature and the red is warmer water and it found even some pretty warm water right here that red little red tip is really really important um, so it found it it was a little snapshot our field program is going to be uh, going onto the ice shelf having a camp in the midst of that area I showed you um, and then drilling a hole and putting a profiler that's going to go up and down so it's not going to wander around like the submarine did but it's going to sit there for a couple of years and, and hopefully capture this warm water and see how that changes over time and the cooler water coming out and get a, give us a different view as to what's going on underneath because we need to get that information um, so just this is going to be the camp it's not our camp yet but it's going to probably look something like that because the wind blows terribly a 50 knot wind is kind of a nice day on the Pine Island ice shell um, um, that's 
parts of the drill. That's the hole we're going to make from a borehole camera. And then that's the profiler that we're going to put in. So we practiced this in a place close to McMurdo Station a few years ago. So we're, we're set to go. It's a big logistic uh, challenge, but, uh, but we're poised to do it this year. Okay, what can I say about the future? I realize I'm running out of time here because many stakeholders, I should turn and bow towards Congress, whichever direction it is, uh, can't wait. The IPCC weighed in on this. Um, that this is how sea level has risen during the last 150 years. There's a slight increase in slope here. It is going up faster. Their, their published predictions were sort of this range here. However, they, they admitted that they did not include ice sheet dynamics, which is about all I've talked about this, this hour. So when you, and you see where the one meter is, the, the few papers that have tried through various means, models and analog studies and, and, and other methods to come up with an estimate for the, for the end of this century, they all come up with bigger numbers. And you can see the large range because the uncertainty is still pretty high. But they're all above this. This is sort of a base. Um, and you add ice sheet dynamics, it's going to push it higher. In some cases, probably a lot higher. And you see now, I, I, I hope you can appreciate why one meter is the best number and, in general, likely a conservative number for where sea level is going to be by the end of this century. There are some estimates that, that the entire range is above one meter, but uh, we have scientific discussions about, uh, about the, the um, rigorousness of that. But one meter keeps coming up again and again and again. This is just to say that it's not going to be uniform everywhere. Let me just skip past that and get to some good news. Um, it's not going to happen tomorrow. I have to be careful when I talk to kids about this. Then, you know, they go home and they cry to their parents that you know, they're going to get flooded that, that night. Um, so the good news is it's, it's, it's gradual, but it is inescapable. We have to accept the reality of it because we can plan gracefully for this. The Navy is very interested in planning gracefully for this. Um, uh, the accurate projections are possible with, with admitted large uncertainties. So we are providing the, this information to, to those of us, the, to those who ask, those stakeholders. And we tell them that we'll get better and better as we learn more and more, as we get out in the field and make more measurements. And, and, it, and it seems to make sense that the investment in the science uh, to, to, prov to allow there to be informed mitigation uh, responses is a whole lot cheaper than ignorance is. Um, ignorance is, it, you don't know what's coming. Um, that's not the best, not the best plan, we, we humbly suggest. Uh, so, uh, conclusions. I hope you, I hope you get it, <laughs> that the ice sheets are, will continue to shrink. They're shrinking now, and they will continue to shrink. And what that means for sea level is that sea level will rise, and the rate of rise will probably increase, and that a one meter is the best number we can give right now. It's still, the IPCC is, is in the process of writing its next report, and uh, I lead one project, and there are many other projects trying to trying to provide to, to that group um, the best updates on, uh, on our projections. And that it affects people, hundreds of millions of people. That's just first order, uh, billions if you consider second order effects. Ice sheets hate water. <laughs> Remember it. Um, and it's the warm ocean water. That's where most of the heat is that's doing most of the damage, where the ice sheets respond most quickly. And we're going to get better at it. If you want more, there's some, some websites here. I, I, I'll just I'll give my thank you slides, ask for questions, and then come back to that if you want to get any of these URLs. That pig, that pig is there because Pine Island Glacier spells pig. <laughs> so, so, well, thanks. I gather we have questions. Yes, sir? Uh, when is the next ice age? Start. Thousands and thousands of years from now. Don't lose sleep over it. So again, that, that really speaks to the time scale. That um, we, we think the ice, she ice sheets and the, the whole glacial interglacial cycle was driven by orbital variations. And so to the extent that that's true, and most, most scientists do buy off on that, um, the next time things are aligned to 
nudge us towards another ice, uh, another ice age is at least 20,000 years in the future. So a lot more is going to happen in the next 20,000 years. So it's kind of off the table. No more questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned this when you were talking about New Orleans and how it changes the way the plates are moving. And I've read some things suggesting that that may increase um, earthquakes. Can you maybe speak to that? Yeah, I mean, the, the question was whether the, the tectonic adjustment that has taken place um, that I mentioned in, in regards to New Orleans might increase the, the frequency of earthquakes. Um, earthquakes is a tectonic phenomenon. So anytime you start pushing plates around either down, up, or, or to the side, um, you, you, it holds the potential for more earthquakes. Um, I think in, I'm speaking a little bit out of my expert, well, well out of my expertise. Uh, I took a seismology course a long time ago. <laughs> but um, in general, the, the Midwest is, is fairly, um, uh, is not prone to earthquakes. So changes in tectonics there are, are not likely to increase frequency of earthquakes. And again, this is more of vertical change rather than plates rubbing against each other. Um, so the places, it, it's not going to change, I think, where earthquakes generally occur. And I doubt very much that there would be um, an increase in the, in the frequency or, or distribution of size of earthquakes from that effect alone. That's right, yeah. You're asking about whether um, this drastic retreat mode stops when the, when the terminus of the glacier reaches shallow water again. And, and it absolutely does. So it's an episodic event. I mean, I showed Helheim Glacier. It received a lot of attention when it was in drastic retreat mode. And then it hit another shallow spot. The retreat stopped and it got a whole bunch of other attention because it stopped. Aha, don't worry about it. Um, but if and that was right, um, and it's starting to try to re-advance right now. But then there's another glacier. There are other glaciers around Greenland that are sort of picking up the slack. So, so it, so that there's a there's a lesson there. <laughs> Don't focus on one glacier um, to read what the Greenland ice sheet is doing. You'll learn a lot about glacier dynamics doing that, but you won't. Um, but you'll miss the big story. And so when you look at the big story. Um, Greenland actually is losing ice faster and faster and faster. There are little blips in there that represent individual glacier components to it. So, yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. Um, now, this is about the time scale. Uh, you said that during the last year glacial, the uh, ocean was five meters higher than it is currently. But if all that stuff melded, Yeah, and, and, and your question about time scale is really important because <clears throat> the last time that, that palm trees were in Antarctica was tens of millions of years ago. So really long time ago. The Earth got into this glacial interglacial cycle in the last few million years. So it's been you know going back and forth uh, just, just in the last few million years. So the palm trees in Antarctica are, are a phenomenon that, that occurred when there was no ice on the planet and uh, it was really a whole lot warmer. But that's a totally different geologic era than the glacial interglacial period of time. Yeah. Well, we had one. How is what I do as a NASA scientist, former NASA scientist, <laughs> compare with what's done at NOAA? Um, we, we play in the same sandbox. Um, and our agencies force us to, to focus on, on a little bit different perspective. But many of the questions, these big questions, are the same. And so we interact an awful lot. 
Um, in terms of satellite data, it doesn't matter to us who collects the data, whether it's whether it's something operated by NOAA or NASA or ESA or or JAXA. Or, um, uh, we are we we have to have our data, you know, where, wherever it comes from. Um, so I, I think I think the differences between agencies become more distinct the higher up the organizational chart you go, and when you're down in the in the working trenches like me, it, it means very very little. transport of heat from the equator north and south via ocean currents and they change as the continents move about. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere which has there's a greenhouse effect. But I'm wondering is there any evidence that the sun itself is a has a cycle of putting out more heat and less heat and uh, do we have enough data to tell you know if if the output from the sun is constant as far as we're concerned, or is it, you know, is it getting hotter or cooler <coughs> enough to change our climate? Yeah, yeah, I mean, time scales again is, is going to be part of this answer. Um, so that you're asking about climate change and, and whether, whether the sun plays a significant role in that. Um, it depends on what type of climate change you're talking about. Like, like the previous question, um, the continents moving around and, and, and changing the shape and, and of the oceans and the ocean circulation, we're talking tens and probably hundreds of millions of years for it, uh, ago for that kind of process to be going on. And yes, Earth had a climate, and yes, it did change, so yes, that's legitimately, legitimately sort of under the topic of climate change. But, but when we're talking about sort of the climate changing right now, it's, it's a whole different set of circumstances. Essentially, the continents are frozen, and it's, and, and they're not moving because we're talking about much shorter time scale in the here and now. Um, when it comes to the sun's influence, if you go to the, in in the near term, the changes that have been observed, uh, and the trends that are occurring now on say the century time scale, the sun is not a player. It does. There is some variability with sunspot sunspot cycle, but it's not. Nobody's been successful in correlating those variations with any variations in the measured uh, climate, any parameter in the climate. But it has gone through larger variations in, in longer time scales, and yes, it does have an influence there. So, so the answer is it depends. And you really have to be careful when you say climate change, what time scale are you, interest, are, are you really focused on? What so. you're talking about is Yes, um, the the and the other greenhouse gases. I mean, the the fact that um, I didn't get around to saying this, so this is an opening. So let me say it: that nobody's asked me yet. How's that warm? Why does that warm water get to the ice sheet now, and it didn't before? So um, it's it's a beautiful illustration of how connected the climate system is. That with the warming of the planet. Antarctica has managed to stay cooler than the rest of the planet. It has sort of its own climate, if you will. It's surrounded by an ocean that helps isolate it. So it's, it's stayed a little bit cooler than the rest of the planet. So you have an increase in that temperature gradient between the rest of the world and, and the southern uh, polar region. And that increases the pressure gradient, and that increases the winds around the continent of Antarctica. And it's that wind that moves the, the water. So you have the water sort of spinning faster and faster around the continent, and that's been measured. And because it's southern hemisphere, the Coriolis force for anything that moves will steer it to the left. So it actually is pushing the surface water away from the ice sheet, just the, na the nature of the circulation here in Antarctica. So that water turns away to the left. And what replaces that surface water is water at depth. We call it upwelling. So, so that warm water essentially gets lifted 
by the by the absence uh, by the absence of that surface water the surface water going farther north and that actually lifts the warm water just enough to get it into those onto the continental shelf where those valleys are so so that's the the linkages of processes that, that we think are responsible for the the fairly sudden uh, increase of um, melting the thinning on the ice shelf and the acceleration of the glaciers it's it's that complicated <laughs> Time for one more, and so neither one of you had that next week. I'll be brief. Are they quick? Are we'll, okay. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah. Yeah, this one's a little bit more about what you were just saying. Can you say something about the orbital variation? More, what's the nature of it? Is it more of a transient and passing, or what is that factor that you're talking about there? About the orbital variations. Yeah. I would say there, <laughs> there's so many generations out, you wouldn't. I mean, things change so slowly. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, how many generations of grandchildren are you worried about? And I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say that's not enough to, to matter. <laughs> uh, this won't matter. It does, but very, very slowly. I mean, when when you show when they show plots of things going up and down, look at look at the look at the time axis, and it's millions of years. So so time scale, time scale, time scale. What is um, the position of the United States um, uh, on uh, global um, energy uh, resource and, um, and economic um, benefits and such? Do you have something? The position of the United States in terms of climate change? Uh, climate change uh, for the um, energy um, uh, policy or energy. Um, uh, uh, well, there are many positions, aren't there? Um, <laughs> We had one question too many, I think. <laughs> but but this this is I mean I'm I'm just speaking about what I know, um, you know what I read in the, in the paper. Again, this this is a, uh, an opportunity to to remind you that as a scientist I deliver the information and I don't set the policy. But um, as a citizen, I would say it's it's very important to recognize the reality of it and and to and not to bury our head in the sand. And um, I would encourage decision makers to to take this information that scientists are providing in all seriousness uh, because I too have kids and I don't want to I don't want to I want to deal with it as directly and as as immediately as possible so that because uh, it's only going to get worse if, if response is delayed. I, I want to take you back on that um, earlier I read articles um, concerning the Arctic um, ice melting mm -hmm. where and um, Norway uh, jumping in um, to drill for um, oil and other um, natural gases. Uh, I just want to know. Um, yeah, the, the scientists are working more and more closely with, with policy making organizations in, in lots of countries because the whole geopolitical landscape in the Arctic, in particular, is, is rapidly changing. And um, so countries are scrambling to, to try to realize that they need to know the best science so that they can position, uh, so they can act in their own best interests most intelligently. So, so there, there's some, there is an increase in appreciation for this information in the U.S. as well as other, other Arctic nations. Okay, thank you for coming. And make sure to stop by the This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.